Hello, this is Mike Johnston, and this is another edition of The Indie Show. Hi there, this is Mike Johnston, and welcome to the podcast for August 5th, 2018. And today I wanted to talk about the whole President Trump, President Putin thing. I mean, I'm not even sure what it is anymore. It started out being, oh, well, the Russians colluded with somebody, maybe in the Trump campaign, and then maybe not, and maybe they just bought a lot of ads, but they tried to influence the election. Okay, that was the first thing. And they might have colluded with some of Trump's campaign people. And then, oh, well, maybe they actually colluded with President Trump himself. Maybe there's some strange relationship between President Trump and President Putin. And that's where we are now. We're still, we still don't have any actual um, answers in, in the form of uh, charges against um, anybody, at least not charges that are related to what is being said. Yes, I mean, some of Trump's campaign people got charged with um, non-related things or vaguely related things, but yet... The core stuff that everybody has been saying has not been proven, at least not to the point where anybody can even bring charges. So that seems kind of sketchy. And, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I realized I don't know that much about Russia. And I don't think a lot of Americans know that much about Russia, especially average, everyday, blue-collar Americans like me. You know, I mean, I went to high school. I graduated high school. I paid some attention in history and and current events and things like that and when I graduated high school we were still um, in the Cold War and the the Soviet Union was as everybody figured except maybe a few people you know like Lee Harvey Oswald we we thought they were our enemy and you know we accepted that and we were afraid of their nukes and stuff and, and we were pretty much convinced that communism wasn't for us so a few years went on and then in 1991 the Soviet Union fell, and that was it. And they had some turmoil and, and ins and outs, and, and, you know, we watched it on the news, and we learned about it as it happened. And then after Boris Yeltsin was out and President, uh, current, still, President Putin was installed, it seemed like everything quieted down and the country was doing a lot better, and we all figured, oh, okay, I mean, you know, this is good. They're sort of a democracy now. And, you know, we don't have to think about them as an enemy anymore. And so we didn't. And now all these years later, all of a sudden, now we're supposed to start thinking of Russia as an enemy again. Why? They launch our astronauts for us to the space station. They launch our supplies to the space station. They've been, like, partnering with us on a lot of things. They cooperated with us in Syria to some extent. They had different goals and they were on a different side. But yet... You know, they tried to cooperate, and we tried to cooperate, and it seemed to work. So, well, how does that make them our enemy? That's what I think people don't understand, and that's what nobody has convinced us of. If somebody actually takes the time to tell us why they are our enemy, I think it would be the way to get Americans on board with things. Because right now, I don't think that we still think of Russia as our enemy. I mean, so what? They bought some ads. You know, I don't think that's going to really sway anybody. I think you need something a little bit bigger than that. Um, So that became my goal for this podcast was to really do some research, at least as good as I could, as good as anybody probably can or will take the time to, who is an average American. So what I did was I found some videos on YouTube from good sources, who, or at least verifiable sources, who will take us from the very beginning of Russia as a country right up to the present time and hopefully look at enough of the pertinent facts as we go so that you can get to the point where you know enough about Russia that you can make up your mind on whether or not Russia is an enemy or at least the the Putin government is potentially our enemy and why and what the um, connection between the Putin government and the Trump government may be. I mean, is it just a simple case of uh, they're plutocrats or kleptocrats or whatever you want to call them, and our 
uh, people of the same nature uh, colluding with each other or getting along. And that's what everybody's afraid of. Oh, you know, but I, I'm getting ahead of myself. First, let's learn about Russia. And then after that, we can come back to our conversation of what's actually going on. Video I watched in my quest to better understand Russia itself was a uh, a five-part video called "The History of Russia: Runrick to Revolution" by Epic History TV, and um, this video is, I think, a sort of historical documentary of the sort that just tells you the facts as they appear in history books, pretty much, and um, it goes. Uh, chronologically from back in the Bronze Age and, and before kind of to the time that the Greeks were um, ascendant in their sphere of influence and then comes right up to the present day and on the way I think you know it, it really brings up a lot of interesting sort of points um, and, and not specifically I mean you just kind of by watching the facts all happen in sequence you you sort of realize how much um, power and influence and wealth the, the nobility of Russia had and not just Russia but the whole of Europe because it seems pretty obvious that over time a sort of ruling class evolved in Europe where the royal families were all um, you know obviously related through the royal bloodline, but yet there was a lot of intermarrying going on between um, royal families of different countries. So, you know, it went from like the royal family of each country being their own unit to where um, there was just one royal bloodline that ruled all of Europe and basically controlled all of the wealth. So, you know, if you if you want to bring it down to where we are today in America, it's kind of like you know, there's been so much in the press about the 1% who control, like, the majority of wealth in the United States and, um, you know, how it's just that big divide in income and wealth and what it does here. And, you know, so obviously there are historical precedents for that. But the first place that I wanted to actually have a look at was... Um, the mid to late 1800s when the serfs in Russia were pretty much liberated and you know I didn't know this I didn't know this that you know right up until the mid to late 1800s eight like 80 percent of the Russian people were essentially slaves and that's by the Wikipedia definition of you know the time and what a serf is um, you didn't own land, you didn't own property, you lived on and worked for a landowner, and, you know, I mean, that's kind of, you know, the way it was in England, and, and you know, anybody who's heard, you know, the King Arthur tales and, and Knights of the Round Table and all that stuff is going to realize, um, you know, that's pretty much the way it was everywhere. But, you know, most parts of Europe had changed their system of governance, and, um, how, uh, you know, the common people basically freed the common people hundreds of years before this. But Russia waited right up until the late 1800s, and I think that's really important. Here, let me, let me show you a clip from the history of Russia that talks about that period. Nicholas I was succeeded by his son, Alexander II. The Crimean War had exposed Russia's weakness. The country lagged far behind its European rivals in industry, infrastructure, and military power. So Alexander, unlike his father, decided to embrace reform. The most obvious sign of Russia's backwardness was serfdom. According to the 1857 census, more than a third of Russians were serfs, forced to work their master's land with few rights, restrictions on movement, and their status passed down to their children. They were slaves in all but name. In 1861, Alexander II abolished serfdom in Russia. 
he was hailed as the Liberator. But in reality, most former serfs remained trapped in servitude and poverty. Alexander's reforms would continue with the creation of the Zemtsva, provincial assemblies with authority over local affairs, including education and social welfare. In the Far East, Russia forced territorial concessions from a weakened China, leading... Another idea that came to me at, at this point, and oh yes, I said 80% were, were serfs, I, was a, I misspoke there, it was 30%. But 30% is still quite a large voting block if you think about it, you know, <laughs> the percentage of the total population. But what, you know, this happened in 1861. And, uh, and at the same time, in the United States, we were also dealing with the question of involuntary servitude more commonly referred to here as slavery instead of serfdom. So we were in the South essentially running the same model as, uh, as the Russians under a different name, uh, you know, and, and perhaps carried it further than the Russians had because I think slavery was more <clears throat> brutal probably than um, serfdom was in Russia. But at any rate, um, you know, and, and in this area they also mention or just illustrate without specifically mentioning that Ukraine was often through history part of Russia and uh, you know so that also helps to bring into um, better perspective the current dispute between the Ukraine and Russia and Crimea and um, how that how that happened and there was a lot of, of backstory to that that they never talk about in the news like you know the fact that okay you know Ukraine was part of Russia for a very long time and including you know during the time of the Soviet Union and so you know once the Soviet Union ended and a lot of countries then broke away from Russia maybe Russia you know kind of overall didn't think that they should be doing that and would like to have them back I don't know I mean in my mind it's sort of like you know, in the United States, we hear, have heard Texas for years talk about seceding and um, forming their own country. And then more recently, California's been kind of bantering about with the same idea. And, but they've never tested it. They've never said, okay, this is it. We're going to secede. We're done with the United States. We're going to be our own country. And it's fun to talk about as, as a theory, you know, a sort of fantasy. But to me, I always remember, like, what happened the last time a few states decided to secede? That was the Civil War. And the United States showed, no, I don't care what the majority of people in your state want. You are not going to leave the Union. And, and I, for the people that think that that might have changed until today... I would say think again. I don't think that America is going to let any states secede willingly because, you know, that just, <laughs> it just opens up a Pandora's box of possibilities that I don't think anybody really wants to face. But I'm not talking about that now. I'm talking about Russia. So let's get on to the next interesting point in Russian history. The next part of the Russian tale would be Bring us ahead a few years. After um, serfdom was abolished to the very early 1900s when communism came to Russia and, and there was the initial revolution that deposed the ruling family in Russia and um, instituted communism. And, and right before that, I think what's interesting to know is that Russia wasn't doing bad at all at that point. So here, here's a really quick clip that I wanted to show you from the history of Russia that um, illustrates this point. Hemophiliac son, Alexei. Despite sporadic acts of terrorism, Russia now had the fastest growing economy in Europe. Agricultural and industrial output were on the rise. Most ordinary Russians remained loyal to the Tsar and his family. Russia's future seemed bright. Okay, and then we move right into the dawn of communism. 
Just for a little bit more information on how Russia got to the point where the communists could take over, the next thing that happened historically was World War I, and Russia's involvement in World War I really kind of broke their economy for the first time, I think. Here's a little snippet on how that happened. Was murdered, possibly with the help of British agents. The war put intolerable strains on Russia. At the front, losses were enormous. While in the cities, economic mismanagement led to rising prices and food shortages. In Petrograd, the workers' frustration led to strikes and demonstrations. Troops ordered to disperse the crowds refused and joined the protesters instead. The government had lost control of the capital. Imperial train at Puskov. Senior politicians and generals told the emperor he must abdicate, or Russia would descend into anarchy and lose the war. Nicholas accepted their advice. After Nicholas abdicated, there was kind of a power vacuum there. You know, once the one percent loses control and the unwashed masses take over. Something has to happen. Somebody has to run things, unless you're an anarchist, in which case you probably think nobody has to run things, and uh, that's another line of reasoning entirely. But in Russia, what happened was a brand new political theory stepped in to fill the vacuum, which was communism. <clears throat> So after the Romanov rule came to an end, the there was a provisional government that was set up, and um, they didn't do a really good job. The economy still kept sliding into chaos, and so all across Russia, people started setting up their own little local governments, and um, they were calling them Soviets. And the person who came out with his Bolsheviks and basically united all those little groups and took over Russia was Vladimir Lenin. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, it's Vladimir Lenin, Vladimir Putin, you know, Putin, Putin. Why am I keep saying it two ways? And I apologize for that, but I'm not sure, I guess, in my mind which way it's supposed to be. So that takes us to the end of this first video. And now we know so much more about Russia. And I, I encourage you to go watch it. It's actually the links, of course, are in the, uh, the podcast or the video description, depending on where you're watching it. And there are a number of videos to watch, but if you watch them all, I think you will really have a much better understanding of the current state of the world and be able to understand the news that you're seeing, where it comes from, what it really means, what the slant that the news person or organization is putting on it, and what they aren't telling you about the backstory. Because if you don't have the backstory, it's really hard to understand what's going on now because so much of history affects it and there is so much history going back you know at least the last hundred years and then beyond that you know a thousand years or more that has influenced everything that we're seeing happen now whenever we're dealing with Europe and Russia and and Asia those countries have all been around for a long time and to just say oh well this is what's happening today 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 without really understanding or at least having having knowledge of you know the backstory really puts the average person at a disadvantage i believe the next video i'd like to put up for your consideration is called the soviet story it was done in 2008 and here is the imdb page for it which i will also put a link to in the description of the video in the description of the podcast or video that you're watching down below and this is this is a little interesting. Um, this film has won some awards at film festivals, and it says <clears throat> in the thumbnail description, the Soviet story offers an alternative history of an allied power which helped the Nazis to fight Jews and which slaughtered its own people on an industrial scale. Okay, that, that doesn't sound good, but it has 8.1 stars, and it has been reviewed many places, um, such as... 
The Village Voice, The Economist, Epic Times, Film Commentarian, Le, Le Figaro, The New York Times, Online Film Data Bank, and, um, okay, I can't read it all, Slant Magazine. There we go. Okay. Now, I mean, I got the impression while watching this that it was kind of slanted in some ways. And the other thing that also was a little bit annoying was that they don't caption it when they interview people who are answering in Russian, you know, because the film itself is done in English. But then they interview various people, you know, like old timers who remember the time that they're covering in that part of the movie. And you can't understand them because they're speaking Russian or whatever. And you know that really i think detracts a little bit but you can still understand what the movie's about certainly and uh you know that's okay uh so just to look at a little bit more of the storyline which kind of gives you a better idea of what i've just been talking about the soviet story is a unique first-time documentary film by director edvin snore the film tells the story of the soviet regime and how the soviet union helped nazi germany instigate the holocaust and i didn't know that part that's that's different um the film shows recently uncovered archive documents revealing this interviews with former soviet military intelligence officials reveal shocking details the soviet story was filmed over two years in russia ukraine latvia germany france uk and belgium material for the documentary was collected by the author for more than 10 years as a result, the Soviet story presents a truly unique insight into recent Soviet history told by people, once Soviet citizens, who have a first-hand knowledge of it. And I think the value of this film to our story here is that um, it takes us from the time that the Soviets came to power right up until after World War II and beyond, I mean... Okay, and be before you go and watch this film, I should point out that it is, there is a lot of disturbing images in it, you know, um, dead bodies stacked up all over the place and, and things like that, and YouTube actually has a content warning before you watch the video that you have to click that you accept and you do want to watch it. However, if you're an adult, it's not a great video for kids, but if you're an adult and you want a better understanding of what happened in Russia during... Um, the period after uh, the the, so the communists came to power up until the end of World War II, and even a little bit beyond that, you know, and especially the things that Stalin and the communists were doing. Um, this this is a uh, it's it's a good piece to watch, and I'm not going to add really very much here in terms of clips to illustrate anything from the film except there's this part that that really maybe kind of go you know have an aha moment where you know because now you see russia um exerting a lot of influence in europe and europe kind of seemingly being afraid to do anything and you know and you know it's like yeah russia supplies gas to a lot of europe and you think well maybe that's part of why you know the the uh the elites in the U.S. want to push Russia back so that maybe we can supply gas to Europe, etc. But you don't know, and that's just there. But here's a comment that um, one of the people being interviewed in this film makes, and I'm, I'm not sure who it is unless it tells you on screen. I don't know. Um, so I apologize for that. But this is a comment that some learned sort of professor-looking person makes about that very situation. So here you go. One knows what Europe, uh, how we depend on uh, so we, uh, Russian gas, petrol, so I think it's a political not well, we, we know exactly why Europe uh, doesn't, well, cannot uh, um, oppose Russia on so many issues. Uh, unfortunately, Europe continues uh, ignore uh, Soviet crimes, mass murders, uh, while millions of the victims uh, are neglected by Europe. Uh and, you know, I'm sure those particular wounds run deep, too, in various parts. But now we are past the Soviet 
part of Russia, and um, that's that's a great documentary to, to watch. Though, if you really don't know that much about the role that Russia played in World War II and the time after that, that is a great documentary to watch. So, um, the link, of course, is below. And now we will move on to the period of the time when the Soviet Union fell, and right after that, which is where we start to get into the period that you know, still affects us the most today and that has the most bearing on the relationship between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. The next video that I'd like you to watch, the next video that I watched, is called Inside Putin's Russia. And it's a video by PBS. Um, so, you know, if, if you're not a fan of, of mainstream media, well, PBS is, is kind of mainstream media. And they pretty much are well known for having a pretty liberal bias. However, I think it's, you know, a, a good video that gives you an insight into Russia today and in the recent past and introduces Vladimir Putin as a player. And it kind of explains why a resurgent Russia as a country um, has, has so taken to having Putin as their leader for what 16 years now and you know I think that's important to understand to really understand Putin his government and how he came into power now you know this being PBS and being mainstream it kind of pretty much gives you the mainstream view of things but that's an important place to start so here's a bit from the intro of inside Putin's Russia from PBS NewsHour to give you an idea how it um, it's going to sound. We'll report on Russian propaganda, Russia's opposition, Russians who join ISIS, and a tense relationship with the U.S. Our first story explores a new Russian identity. It's a combination of religion, old Russian traditions, and rediscovered patriotism. This new identity helps explain a lot about how today's Russia thinks, how President Putin acts, and why he remains popular. Okay, and that's that's pretty much where this video takes us, and I, I do think it's important. So, I want to look at another uh, a piece or two of what they do in this video before we get to the next one, because it's kind of going to be a little bit of a counterpoint with the next one. I'm going to introduce an author who is apparently pretty well respected in academic circles, and you know, therefore, I suppose he's been vetted pretty well. Um, he's done a couple of books which are, are pretty well received and he uh, you know speaks at um, think tanks and things like that although you may have never heard of him he does he does bring an interesting viewpoint to this discussion okay so the first bit from um, inside Putin's Russia is uh, this guy right here. I want to I listen to him because he expresses some interesting things from the Russian perspective and he gives us kind of an insight into what it is to be a Russian today, at least from the perspective of the Russian leadership. For years, TV fixture and firebrand Alexander Dugin inspired the Kremlin's ideology. He says Russia's collective identity comes from patriotism projection of power and respect for the rule. Putin taps into all three, connecting today's Russia to its imperial grandeur. Patriotism is organic, it is not artificial. Empire or state is not something additional or artificial. Because it is our breath, our skin, our organic way of life. Today's Kremlin uses that patriotism to try and unite the population and convince them only a powerful state can protect them from enemies. Enemy number one, the U.S. America is on the brink of a revolution. Dugan and the Kremlin accused the U.S. of humiliating Russia by expanding NATO to Russian borders and supporting revolutions in former Soviet states and satellites. Dugan advocates fighting back by attacking the West with asymmetric war. And you talk about introducing geopolitical disorder, actively supporting dissident movements, extremism, racist, sectarian groups. This seems much more than just Exactly as you do. It's exactly what you do. You are supporting separatist group, you are supporting any kind of nationalism, including Russian nationalism that is against Putin. My words are the mirror of what? And, and he basically is saying that, okay, we're sitting here behind our border saying, 
you know we know what you are doing you know what we are doing and it's essentially the same thing now that's a great realization and it's probably the truth because at that point you have to say okay well how you know how do we get past that you know and maybe the current governments or the current leaders on both sides you know are not the best people to do that because you know i think russia is probably from the perspective of the russian people at the best place it's been maybe ever because you know like i said earlier they were serfs for so long at least a, a large percentage of them and then after serf demanded communism started right away and they were kind of back in the same thing where well okay you still don't get to own any personal property and you know you're just a little um cog in a machine of the state and all that and then you know that ended and and whatever form of democracy they have at the moment happened and you know they have freedom now and it's probably taken a while to really you know uh, understand that on a personal level for a lot of people i mean there were a lot of people obviously that jumped right in and made a lot of personal wealth from that and that's also part of what we're going to talk about but um, I just try to take this sequentially and look at it piece by piece and, and show you like um, really how things got to be where they are between the United States and Russia and how things and give you a better understanding of Russia. So um, let's move on to the next point. In this next bit, we move to where um, the, the trouble, the, mo the recent trouble with Ukraine starts and Crimea is annexed by Russia. And um, it's just looking at how that all happened. And I think it's interesting because it shows how governments work. Here, listen to this. To the people with the same culture as mine, the same language, the same worldview. He was, he was convinced of that by propaganda. In May 2014, dozens of pro-Russian separatists died in Odessa, Ukraine. It probably became the pivotal moment. There was a lot of information about how people were simply getting beaten and killed. Russian media exaggerated the attack, <laughs> even using an actress to play a victim. We know she was an actress because she appeared in unrelated pro-Russian stories as three entirely different people. <laughs> and this is the kind of story that happens in the real world and this is the kind of thing that fuels the crazy conspiracy people if you want to put it that way who um look at things like sandy hook and say oh well this might have been a totally other thing and really go down a strange dark pathway with it um two people who maybe actually try to find alternative evidence or explanation in things because sometimes that exists and this right here illustrates it as does on this side of the Atlantic things like the way that we got into the Iraq war on the uh, erroneous belief that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and that has been called into question that belief whether the people who were calling the shots in starting that war actually knew that there weren't any weapons of mass destruction and I've, I've read that and I've seen that several places and also I believe it was at the start of the first Iraq war where um, a girl was talking on video about seeing the Iraqi troops in Kuwait pulling babies out of incubators and throwing them on the floor so that they could steal the incubators and it turned out that that girl was actually the daughter of an ambassador and was lying that that incident had never happened but it was one of the big incidents that convinced average Americans that yes we should start the uh, the first Gulf War so there's just a few examples and I'll try to give links here in the description to um, places that I've seen that that seem relatively credible and uh, just to show you that yes okay we can say yeah Russia does this Russia does this propaganda kind of thing and uses actors and that's one of the things that the conspiracy theorists like to throw out there crisis actors and you know people that they see in multiple videos that um, look like the same person from from various 
different big news story tra- tra- yeah tragedies sorry about that so uh, it's just something to think about I mean there's there's no more proof than what there is to that but you know it, it does happen and it is a vehicle that people use to control other people so it's something to just bear in mind that not everything you see even on the mainstream news may be the truth one another of the things that are faced in Russia which are similar to what we face in the United States are domestic acts of terrorism and this PBS piece also delves into that a little bit and I'd like to play you a little clip of that here because I would like you to see how the Russian response to such acts of domestic terrorism is very similar to what we have seen in the United States. ...insurgency here in the capital of Dagestan, the Hajj Kala, for years, targeting both local authorities and symbols of the national government. Their most prominent attacks targeted civilians in larger cities. In Moscow in 2010, militants allied with Al-Qaeda blew up the subway. In 2013, in Volgograd, they blew up a bus station and then a commuter bus, as seen on Russian media. There was no social or physical protection. Every day there were bombings, terror attacks that cost people's lives. Habib Magomedov is a former police lieutenant colonel and member of Dagestan's anti-terrorism committee. He says conservative Islam, combined with high rates of unemployment and poverty, to radicalize. It's the living conditions, absence of possibilities, absence of social mobility, which creates waves of anger and distress. There has to be some sort of history that sets the person on a certain track where you only need to light a match for the fire to start. That match is often a brutal security crackdown. And in the end, it just talks about, I, I don't want to use too much of that clip, it just shows that the Russians have responded by taking away freedoms and, and limiting um, individual freedoms for the good of the whole, kind of the way we have in the United States since 9-11. And 9-11 is also something where, and this is something I never even knew about. I mean, I remember it vaguely from the time it happened, but um, which was while Boris Yeltsin was still president of Russia. And... At that time, there were some apartment building bombings, um, which leveled apartment buildings and killed hundreds of people. And it was blamed on another country and was the basis to start a war with that country for Russia. And um, that's the, some of the topic of the next video by an author called um, David Sater. And he was a reporter who lived in Russia for um, a period of time until the Russians threw him out. And uh, he, he developed a, uh, a theory about those apartment bombings, especially since the final one, the bomb didn't go off. And that, according to his description, was in an apartment building that was kind of built on a hillside so that if it would have been blown up, it would have tipped over and landed on more buildings that were further down the hill and, and killed even more people. But what happened was a resident of the apartment that was apparently to be blown up saw some sketchy looking people in the basement called the authorities the authorities came went into the basement and found a big bomb and so they called in the bomb squad who de- who deactivated the bomb and brought it out and they tested it and it was the same sort of explosive that had been used in the previous apartment building bombings and it was a military grade detonator and so they locked down the city and started searching for the the people that had been seen down there when the bomb was planted they eventually caught the three people that had been doing it and it turned out that they had credentials from the russian intelligence service and the next day the the leader the head of the russian intelligence service um, went on tv and told everybody that okay that was a drill awesome job people you figured it out and uh and that was where it ended and it's Mr. Sater's contention that it was actually the intelligence services who were blowing up buildings and killing Russians to create a pretext to go to war. And that is like, you know, to hear him describe it, and it just sounded so much like things that we are a little more familiar with here in the U.S. as happening here. Um, you know, the way 9-11 happened, there was so much 
questioning down the road about how much people knew in advance. Could we have stopped it? Why didn't we do this? Why didn't we do that? And I remember right after it happened, I was reading um, and, and watching some videos on the theories that were developing around that. And, you know, I kind of lost interest when the conspiracy people were going off onto such wild tangents that they obviously weren't even true, that just somebody with a casual knowledge of aircraft knew were not true. Like, um, for example, I remember seeing videos of, uh, like, people commenting that, you know, videos from 9-11 where the, the aircraft, you could see the bottom of it, the bottom of the plane before it hit the building, and there was obviously an apparatus strapped to the bottom or however you affix it, strapped to the bottom of the airplane. And they were saying that was everything from bombs to missile missile launchers to suitcase nukes. And <clears throat> I, I, uh, I was at an airport in that same time frame, and I, I saw planes that had those things. And I asked somebody, what are those things on the planes, just out of curiosity? And they said, oh, they're auxiliary fuel tanks. Those planes, you know, are coming in from, like, Europe or wherever where they have a little extra fly time and they put some extra fuel on and it's an ex external fuel tank. And I'm like, yeah, okay, makes sense. And so that's, you know, the downside of the conspiracy theorists. They usually don't take time to actually investigate things as fully as they pretty easily could. But... At the same time, I mean, if you listen to David Sater explain it, even in the, the little video clip I'm going to show you, which was um, from 2003, it's it's eerily similar to what happened on 9/11. And this this is the start of that video, and it, con conveniently in the start of it, he kind of outlines at least some of what he's talking about in the video, and there is. A little promo for his book and I'll, I'll put a link in the description so that if you're interested in the book you can go check it out on Amazon his new book darkness at dawn finds rampant corruption in this transition from totalitarian communism to democratic capitalism the program's one hour We all know that after the uh, terrorist attack on September 11th, the first person to offer his condolences to the United States was Vladimir Putin. And one of the points that Putin made was that uh, Russians can well understand the feelings of Americans because they themselves were the victims of a terrorist attack. In Russia, he itself the terrorist attack that he was referring to is well known. It was the bombings of the apartment buildings in Moscow, Volgodonsk, and Buinaksk in September 1999. Those bombings were attributed to Chechens and Chechen terrorists and were the pretext for the launching of the Second Chechen War, a war which continues to this day. But the question arises, what if the terrorist attack that Putin was referring to was not carried out by Chechens, but on the contrary, was carried out by elements of the Russian government itself. And he does make a pretty good case for that, you know, based on evidence. Well, I mean, if the operatives in that um, last bombing wouldn't have gotten caught, it probably would have never been exposed, and it would have just been... Um, accepted as truth that it was another country or uh, agents of another country who had staged the apartment b bombings and therefore it was a justified war that ensued. Um, David Sater is a really, really interesting author and um, speaker. And if you want to understand Russia in the period between the Soviet Union and more modern day Russia, um, he is a great resource to go to and he seems to speak, at, you know, well, there is a video from C-SPAN and he's, you know, like a fellow and a speaker at, at many think tanks and, and universities and stuff like that. So he seems to be an accepted authority um, on the subject and I haven't vetted him any more than that other than to accept that he is accepted by other people who seem to be, you know, um, fairly respectable. Okay, next up in my quest to understand the current situation between the United States and Russia and the relationship between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin brought me to another video 
from the Hudson Institute in uh, May of 2016 it was done which again features author journalist David Sater and he's talking it's, it's kind of a rehash of the earlier stuff from what his, his time in Russia up to the present and he does mention now President Donald Trump in some interestingly predictive ways and it just makes you realize that you know I think this guy actually really knows what he's talking about and some of the things that come out in this video, which are very important to understand, is the transition between communism and the current Russian economic model and how that came to be and who won and who lost out of it. And at that time, a lot of the winners were the people that went on to become known as oligarchs. And we still hear about those today, those people. And some of them have changed and, and the whole thing has evolved somewhat since then but in the immediate aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union what happened was people who were managers and had control of assets of the country as part of the Soviet Union where the state owned everything simply took ownership of the things that they had been tasked to manage and this can be um, minerals, um, oil, manufacturing, uh, processing of raw materials. All of those things were simply taken over by the people that had been managing them as part of the communist government and sold or operated at a profit and made billionaires of these former um, Soviet government flunkies who, you know, were up and comers, right? They were climbers. They got into those positions within the, the Communist Party. So they were the obvious ones to do well in capitalism when they were turned loose in that environment. Um, <clears throat> an interesting thing to note here is that both of President Donald Trump's wives, I think he just had two or did he had three? Did he marry Marla Maples or was that just his girlfriend? I forget. I'm sorry. But I, Ivana Trump and um, the current first lady both grew up in communist countries while they were still communist, while the Soviet Union was still there. Um, uh, in the case of first lady Melania Trump, um, I believe she grew up in Czechoslovakia, which was not part of the Soviet Union, but, um, you know, it was, it was a communist country, and obviously they uh, were somewhat supported um, and, and propped up by the Soviet Union. And Ivana, I believe, grew up in Yugoslavia, which was more of a satellite state of the Soviet Union, I believe. So anyway... Um, so there's some definite ties between the Trump family and Russia and the communist state. Now, you know, I, I don't know uh, the, the political philosophy of, of either of those women or, you know, what whether they, um, you know, have anything to do with government or ever cared anything about government. But I do know in the case of Melania Trump from reading... Um, a biography, I think on Wikipedia, which I'll put a link to. Her father was a member of the Communist Party in that country and the manager of, um, I believe, some sales outlets for the government-produced automobiles. So once the, uh, the economy in, in that country collapsed, I don't know what he did. Did he, did he become a businessman and oligarch or or what happened there i don't know it's just an interesting aside that both of uh or at least two of president trump's wives were communists and i probably should have uh, researched that a little bit further but it wasn't actually a main point of this story so i didn't sorry i apologize for that at any rate this is a great video from david sater because it brings us up into more um the current era and it, and it explains how things happened and, and how things were divided and um, how President Putin came Putin why do I say Putin and then Putin I don't know it's just like my brain just throws in whatever it thinks is necessary there for that particular comment because I, I catch myself saying it both ways I don't know at any rate and this is a great video if you want to watch something that really kind of brings you up to speed this is the video for it if you don't want to learn about the history of Russia you just want to learn about what's going on now this is where you can start 
And moving on from David Sater a little bit here, I, uh, I wanted to throw in a video that gives you a perspective on the, uh, the, my, the more of a perspective. I mean, it was touched on a little bit earlier but in the, in the PBS video, but more of um, an up-to-date view on the mindset of, of the Russian people outside of um, Vladimir Putin and his government. Um, this video is from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, which is a think tank, and I'm not sure of their philosophical or political alignment, but it's, um, it's a video in which some people who are, were, are or were part of the Russian government, along with candidates for parties who oppose Putin and a journalist or two as well, talk about... Um, modern Russia and and the Putin regime what may be wrong with it in their opinion and you know what and it gives you a different view it, it you know it gives you the alternative view because I think too much we are conditioned in America to just look at another country especially a country which is our enemy as kind of a homogenous uh outlook you know like okay whatever the government of that country says is how all the people feel and so we can just if necessary go in there with our army and kill them all because they're all the same but that's not true anymore than it's true in america we're not all the same and you know we have a leader donald trump who represents us and uh at the same time, you have a lot of people who are very vocally saying he doesn't represent them and making their opinion known. And I think that's what's really lacking in our understanding of Russia is, you know, maybe there are a lot of Russians who are saying Vladimir Putin is not our president. And this is the way we feel about it. This is how we think things should be run. But we never get to really hear that in the United States. And that's a shame because if you look at it like... Um, you know, right now is Vladimir Putin and the Russian oligarchs are running Russia. Well, then in the United States, we have right now Donald Trump and his billionaire friends running the United States. And those two viewpoints might be very similar because they are very rich people who are in control of in huge swaths of the world who are gathered together for unity and strength and they stay in power that way on both sides of the Atlantic and, and Europe and, you know, whatever, the Pacific, how, where are we closest? Oh, Alaska, that's right. You can basically spit to Russia from out in the Aleutians. <laughs> so anyway, um, it just seems to be very similar. Like right now, uh, Putin and his oligarchs are very similar to Trump and his billionaires. And that may be the basis right there for what everybody is talking about as far as why Russia is the enemy of the United States on one hand and why everyone thinks that Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin may be cut from the same cloth and may be friends and etc, etc, etc. It brings us right up into the modern age and and I just after watching this video I thought wow this is really interesting why don't the people who oppose Donald Trump in the United States reach out and have some discussion and some interaction social networky sort of interaction with the people who oppose Vladimir Putin in Russia and maybe come up with an alternative that maybe speaks for the majority of average everyday people in both America and Russia because maybe if the the billionaires and the oligarchs can find a common ground from which to rule the world maybe the rest of us can too and you know it's just a thought but I think it's worth thinking about and if you think about it my next thought in the line of reasoning that that represents is simply how did the average people of the world get left out of globalization because I mean starting with well Clinton is the first president that I was really aware of talking a lot about you know globalization through NAFTA and how you know the United States was destined to become a great service economy leading the world through service 
and uh, and then of course you know the fact that he was a Democrat and then the Republicans all seemed to climb on that bandwagon and be like, yeah it's great and the corporations all climbed on board and they thought it was great and, and they're making billions and trillions of dollars by making cheap stuff overseas with slave labor in Russia and shipping it back to the US and thereby sending you know jobs and dollars out of the u.s to other countries and not replacing those jobs that they sent out with jobs here and where did the average people fit into this globalization because we had governments who have traditionally always been global because they talk back and forth and negotiate on a global level and now you brought corporations and businesses into that sphere who also now operate globally, but your average citizen is still more or less stuck on a little patch of ground where they live. I mean, you know, there's some potential for mobility, certainly, and a lot of people from America have gotten jobs in Japan and China and, and everywhere else, but they're, you know, maybe kind of on the best and brightest side of things who you know have gone to college and have a skill and have knowledge that is valuable in other countries so okay but really you know there's no um coming together of people from all over the world to say like okay well hey let's you know be global as a people and and find ways that we can all work together and yes, we have representatives to do that for us, but you know, it seems like the representatives have been doing things from the top down, from that perspective. Like the corporations all have it first, and yes, you know, the standard of living has gone up in China for a lot of people, and it's 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 state level or even gone down for a lot of people in the U.S. as a result. And that kind of seems like the logical outcome because, you know, there's only so many resources, and depending on how they're allocated, someone goes up, someone goes down. But anyway, that's a whole different video. And I think this video is great because it kind of gives you perspectives as far as what the average Russian people might think outside of Putin. And, you know, maybe gives us the idea that the Russian people are not the enemy of the, the people of the United States. The next thing I'd like to look at, and, and the final um, video, is... A uh, two-part series that was done by Zembla in the Netherlands, and uh, if you this is their YouTube channel, and if you can't read that, then you are like me because it's it's not in English. So um, I, I watched this two-part video series, and I was kind of blown away by the depth of investigative journalism that they exhibited, and you know that's almost something you don't see anymore is really good investigative journalism. Um, I mean, for me, I remember back in the old days when um, there was more of a focus you know, on actual investigations by journalists like Geraldo Rivera back in the day. I think he was at least like presenting himself as an investigative journalist with like, you know, the camera slung over his shoulder and, you know, the, the vest with, you know, 35 millimeter film in it and stuff like that. Just <clears throat> like the movie version of investigative journalism before he became what he is today as far as you know a, a strictly conservative commentator but anyway um hey you know and and you go where your uh, beliefs take you and, and i'm kind of apolitical really i mean i i see certain goodness and badness in just about any political system but um you know if you ask me personally my convictions i lean toward a sort of uh well-regulated capitalism because i think it's human nature to want to strive to better your lot in life as an individual as a family and you know we can't have a political system that limits your rights to do those things but at the same time i think everybody has certain rights i mean you know if the prize is to be rich then fine you have to allow people to achieve that goal but at the same time, not step on too many people on their way to the top, which is why I specify well-regulated capitalism, because I think capitalism has been the best, most reliable system that um, human beings have ever had, and it has shown its best side when it was more regulated by the people, 
like you know back in the day when unions were strong and everybody could have a one wage earner and still afford a house and a vacation and all that stuff and and those were the days i was born after that but it was close enough that everybody i knew as adults growing up remembered that time and everybody thought it was a great time to be alive and now we have gone you know in america in the other direction a lot and you know first we might have swung way liberal and then we went way conservative and the overall though i think has been that we've swung way more conservative and that is represented by unregulated capitalism and um you know the left is socialism or, or overregulated capitalism um and and somewhere in between those two i think is is where we're going to find our happy medium but anyway this is again a station or a uh, youtube channel called zembla and they do have social media facebook google plus twitter linkedin if you'd like to connect with them and I, since i couldn't read the description i translated it on google translate and it essentially says zembla is the current research journalistic program of the vara the program wants to inform a broad public with opinion forming journal journalism zembla thoroughly examines developments and events in society and contributes to the forming of opinions about this okay so they have a lot of good goals there but I still don't really understand who they are, and I wanted to do that before I presented them to you so that you had a good idea of who they were because their videos could be kind of inflammatory if a lot of people watch them, um, or at least certainly a lot more educational than the American media is. So I turned to my old friend Wikipedia, and I found that Vara is a public broadcaster from the Netherlands. Um, they're essentially the PBS of the Netherlands. VARA Broadcasting Association is a Dutch public broadcasting association primarily to television, radio, publishing, and interactive. It's owned and operated by the Netherlands Public Broadcasting. Well, okay. So I'm willing to give them the same consideration that I would give to PBS. And we've already had an American PBS video, so why not the Netherlands? The Netherlands is certainly not an enemy of the United States in political philosophy or any other way. So it seems to be worth watching. So um, getting on to their video, um, they have put out a lot of videos, like they said, they, you know, just like American PBS has put out a lot of videos. Essentially, the part that we're going to focus on is called The Dubious Friends of Donald Trump. And there is a, this is a two-part documentary series. Um, and I originally found it on somebody else's channel who had like mirrored it, but I wanted to go to the source and this is the source. So, um, and then it really does on the ground investigative journalism into people that Trump has done business with and his connections to the oligarchs of Russia and, you know, um, kleptocrats. I mean, I've heard various russians called various things at different times um kleptocrats is probably more recent than the oligarchs the oligarchs being the ones like i said that originally um, appropriated all of the soviet government property when the soviet government collapsed and there was all that chaos and and they profited so um now there are more people but it it, it doesn't speak in um generalities it actually brings in people by name and tracks them down or at least attempts to track them down and talks to them about donald trump and how they may have known him and and um i think it's it's a really awesome view myself and i i love the way that they uh they bring everything together they've did, done a really good job with these videos and, and you really should watch them but uh check out the intro Not this part. Almost there. Sorry, I started a little too soon. And the spectacle of the American presidential election is, is so embodied by that. And, you know, we are the champions by Queen playing in the background as the silhouette president walks onto the stage. It's, uh, 
it's it's really well produced you know it'd be it'd be a uh, great fiction if it if it wasn't true or some weird amalgamation of, of truth and fiction that we live under um but anyway okay the first installment this is a two inst installment documentary the first installment focuses specifically on the russians and um comes to some interesting conclusions okay and it sets it up with you know the election having happened and then it introduces the uh the question of of russian meddling in the election and russian collusion vladimir putin is said to have incriminating information about his personal and financial affairs there are persistent rumors about financial connections with russia fake news according to trump I own nothing in Russia. I have no loans in Russia. I don't have any deals in Russia. Why would Trump so vehemently deny any ties to the Russians? There is Russian money that may have um, sources that are scandalous. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. And the the first part of this video they talk about um money from the oligarchs essentially trump had connections to russia back into the time of the fall of the soviet union because there were all these oligarchs and apparently they needed to launder some of their ill-gotten money and they were investing that ill-gotten money into a lot of things in the united states to Legitimize, legitimize the money that they got from less than legitimate sources and these were billions of dollars and it, there's actually a quote from President Trump's son from that era where he said that a lot of the money that the Trump organization had as far as investment was coming from Russia and that's since been really downplayed but you know it's, it's brought up again in this video and probably is worth considering like where did that money at that time come from you know was there a lot of russian money if there was where did it come from in russia was it legal money was it illegal money was it being laundered knowingly or, or not knowingly or i mean it, it raises a lot of questions Oh, and, and I apologize in the earlier parts of this video, or this podcast, rather. Sorry, it's, it's I'm doing it as a video and a podcast. If there were some crickets in the background, I didn't think they were being picked up, but as I was editing, I was hearing that the crickets did get picked up. And what they are is, yes, I had crickets in my office. They belong to my little girl. She's six, and she has a cricket cage with some pet crickets. Um, it's her first real pet of her own, and... Um, I like to have them in the office because I like their little noises in the background. And uh, again, I, I apologize. I've moved them to another room. But um, I am not going to redo the whole first part of the podcast just to eliminate the crickets when they are actually nice, soothing sounds. The Zembla documentary starts during or at the time of the presidential election. And um, I'll let you hear a little bit of the beginning of the video so you, you understand where they're coming from with it. I believe we will have a very good relationship with Russia. I believe that I will have a very good relationship with Putin. Our investigation begins during the American election campaign where it first becomes clear that there is a special connection between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. When I heard that, I thought, well, that's very unusual. That's almost an endorsement. And here is where the documentary introduces uh, Malcolm, Malcolm Nance as an expert and uh, <clears throat> Malcolm has written several books he's um, a former US intelligence officer um, military um, officer and I have included a link to check out his books in the description um, but you know it starts out by saying that okay even from the election as we all know there was some suspicion here and then it builds from there and one and yes it talks about the uh, 
the Trump connection to oligarch money back in the 90s, but it also points out um, more recent connections to the Russians um, and, the, and the, the Trump business in more recent times, including um, ties to reputed or proven members of the Russian mafia, which is, is pretty interesting. Why would Vladimir Putin be endorsing Donald Trump? In Washington, we meet Malcolm Nance. Over the past 30 years, he has worked for various American intelligence services, including the CIA and the NSA. Nance has written a bestseller on manipulation of the presidential elections. Okay, so, and that's a little bit about Malcolm Nance and, you know, kind of gives his bona fides and why he is probably somebody that deserves a listen. From here, we move on, you know, kind of getting into directly... Uh, the Russian Mafia and people who are associated with the Trump empire who are or were or very much probably were part of the Russian Mafia and the position that at least one of those people held within the Trump organization fairly recently. The next expert brought in by the documentary is named Michael D'Antonio, who is an author and has written a sort of biographical book about Donald Trump called The Truth About Trump. And here he gives his opinion on the election hacking. And, and the documentary has already introduced um, the many investigations that Congress currently has, the, uh, the DNC email hacking incident, and, and who might be responsible for that, and Trump's views on it. So now that's where Mr. D'Antonio speaks. This is practically an act of war in the age of information. Why isn't he demanding answers? He meaning he's Trump. Not? He doesn't want to know. Why does Donald Trump insist that he has no involvement with the Russians? We also asked Pulitzer Prize winner Michael D'Antonio. He has interviewed Donald Trump many times and wrote a best-selling book about him. It's likely that there is Russian money that's uh, flowed into Trump uh, organization entities in one way or another and that some of this money may have um, sources that are scandalous and would be and and so it all comes back to the money right i mean the old saying is follow the money and here that's uh what and i i didn't realize he had won a pulitzer but uh yeah so michael d'antonio um pulitzer prize winning author um has followed the money and the the documentary just goes on from there to talk to various people who have followed the money and also to track down at least one member of the russian mafia who became or alleged member of the russian mafia who uh, allegedly worked for the trump organization and had uh, a fairly high level position in that in trump tower an office in trump tower and was a um an advisor to uh president trump himself in his business capacity and also as part of this the documentary looks at a company called bayrock which is a a current big investor into a um uh, an apartment, a, a high, a luxury, ultra luxury apartment complex in New York City that was built by Trump and Bayrock as kind of, I guess, a joint project. And the people behind Bayrock and the uh, the kind of shell companies that exist there to sort of make everything work with you know billions of dollars of investment capital, and uh, they found that there's actually um, an active lawsuit involved there. So this is a little piece about that lawsuit with Bayrock and um, Trump. We discover that there is a lawsuit pending in New York against Bayrock. The company is accused of large-scale tax fraud. We want to know more. We make an appointment with the man who is prosecuting the case against Bayrock for the state of New York fraud expert and lawyer Fred Oberlander. Anybody running a business through a pattern of crime is guilty of racketeering. Anybody knowing what they're doing and helping him is guilty of racketeering. Conspiracy 
they go to jail, and anybody injured by what they did can sue for triple damages. We delve into the history of Bayrock and end up with this businessman, Tafik Arif from Kazakhstan. Arif's family have made their fortune in the chromium industry. In 2001, he sets up Bayrock. He certainly was a figurehead for the company. Okay, and I'm not going to go any deeper than that. I mean, I think that the head of Bayrock might be someone you could consider um, as part of, as coming from Kazakhstan, which was part of the Soviet Union. So you might be able to consider him or his family as those who became oligarchs and profited from the, uh, the resources of the former Soviet Union. So there's a direct, as, as about a direct connection as you can possibly have between the Trump organization and the Russian oligarchs. And maybe that's just the way business is done. I mean, a lot of people from the United States went to Russia and made money after the fall of the Soviet Union. Okay, I mean, that's just obvious. Again, it's like, you know, with globalization, a lot of people went to the Far East, a lot of people went wherever there was money to be made and made money. And of course, since the oligarchs were the people that came into possession of all the resources and manufacturing capability of the former Soviet Union, it just um, follows that those were the people that you had to deal with if you were going to do business and make money in post-Soviet Russia. So, okay, but does that make it right? Does you know that make it okay that the leader of the free world at the moment has all these ties to Russia? And and I, I think it's important. And the documentary goes on to explore where it all went from the days of the oligarchs and and the fall of the Soviet Union. And this pretty much brings it in to the modern era it's like the same billions from the same sources are being now invested all over the world and growing and making even more money so you know we're still in the era where you have these fantastically wealthy billionaires that are essentially running the world and <clears throat> i mean is that collusion when you have billionaires from the u.s and billionaires from russia making decisions that are both business oriented and politically oriented because when you're at that level you almost have to control the politics or at least have a significant majority voice in the politics and the policies of countries that are are working together under your um you know business umbrella so that you can do business profitably i mean it just makes sense and being aware of that and not acting like it's you know some kind of well conspiratorial behind you know oh you know this is probably not true no it is true because it's just common sense it's it's human nature you have to have control of your environment to the extent that you can and that's where our elected representatives are supposed to be the the mediary and um you know prevent those billionaires at the top from having too much power and represent the interests of the people and whether they're doing that or not as well as they could you know that's up to to the people and um and and having elections which is how we determine those people but anyway so this is is getting into some pretty fascinating stuff and they, they explore in a reasonable amount of depth what's going on with that particular relationship and others and introduce somebody who came from Bayrock who then is the person I, I talked about as being potentially part of the Russian Mafia, at least the Russian Mafia in New York, who then joined the Trump empire and became an advisor to President Trump when he was still businessman Trump. Next the video tracks down um, Felix Sater who is related to Bayrock and also another of the folks from the former so billionaires from the former Soviet Union who have um, done some investing in the Trump organization and in this case they actually tracked the guy down to his house and I think that is so cool because it's like it puts a face on you know the people that we uh, we are not so familiar with and and this is the guy that's also accused of being a former mobster 
and has a position with the Trump organization or had a position with the Trump organization. I'm not sure if he still does. But um, this is just interesting to watch them meet the guy. And, I mean, I think it's just great for that reason because they just walk up to his door, knock, and, and he answers, and they're, like, you know, able to talk to him. And, well, here it is. Who has allegedly worked intensively together with Krapanov, Felix Sater, the man with the close ties to the mafia and to Donald Trump. We have finally found his home address. What does Sater know about the Dutch money laundering structure? Hello, Mr. Sater. I'm a Dutch journalist, um, and I'm doing a report on um, Bayrock. We came across some companies in the Netherlands. Okay, which companies? Bayrock BV. And cuss by I beefy. You send me an email uh, to me and my training. Hold on, I'll give you the email address. Yes. And you can send me all your questions. Okay, I wait. My email, and this is my attorney's email. His name is Robert Wolf. And this is where the conversation essentially ends. It's all talk to my attorney. But you know what's fascinating here is that this guy, who may be a pivotal figure in, you know, being a, a former mobster and part of a multi-billion-dollar company called Bayrock, and part of the Trump Organization as a Trump advisor, and at one frame in in the documentary they show his business card, which which lists him as a a senior advisor to Donald Trump in the Trump business. Um, and, you know, he, he's in, you know, like what looks like a Long Island neighborhood, um, of just average, ordinary, middle-class sort of houses. And I guess it just goes to show you, you never really know who your neighbors are. The final video in this two-part series explores the connections between Donald Trump and mostly one person who is known as the King of Diamonds, who is another sort of uh, oligarchical person with with billions and billions of dollars and and part of like i said what really made this series interesting other than everything that it uncovers is just the glimpse into the lives and lifestyles of these billionaires and how much they're pretty much really just regular everyday people who have been fantastically lucky at some point in their lives or or their you know, forebears, their parents, their grandparents, somewhere along the line, somebody got incredibly lucky. And other than that, they're just average people prone to the same sort of um, thoughts and, and deeds and goodness or badness as everybody else and really don't deserve any kind of special treatment and are perfectly understandable to everyday people. Um, let me let me play you the beginning of the second video of this series, um, and it kind of lays out where they're going with it. Donald Trump worked together with the Kremlin to become president. There's just an enormous amount of evidence uh, out there indicating that. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. What role do Trump's questionable contacts with Russian billionaires play? Trump and his friends have absolutely no problem doing business with KGB agents, ex-mobsters, money launderers, you know, oligarchs of all description. Zembla investigates Donald Trump's friends. And there you go. And they go on from there just to keep building and building and building the case. And I think what's really interesting also about this series is the fact that it's not made in the U.S. It's not made with a, a slant, a U.S. Pers you know, a, a perspective of the U.S. Maybe it's a European perspective, but that's probably different from what we see here in the U.S. Because here we see pretty much news that is all slanted toward an American viewpoint, an American perspective. Unless you go online and you watch RT, in which case you get the official russian government perspective even though they kind of say that they don't do that it's it's if you watch you know various shows that it shouldn't be really that political and you see that they just tend to randomly throw in political endorsements of putin then you kind of realize that uh yeah it is slanted to russia which is you know as long as you know that then you accept it and you can watch it through that lens um 
And that's pretty much where I'd like to leave it. I think we've gone through an interesting journey, and I hope you've watched these videos along with me because they're really informative. And, and I think it's, um, at least I know for me, it's, it's brought me to a point where I feel like I really understand better Russia as a whole, the Russian people to some extent, and mostly how the Russian government has operated and, and you know, changed over the years. And, and in a, on a larger scale, the governments of the world, how we went from, you know, back in the Middle Ages where serfdom was just the way it was for pretty much everybody and other forms of slavery in other parts of the world and how that 1% the ruling royalty has always been in charge and that they were in charge in Europe for hundreds of years if not over a thousand years or more than that I don't know I didn't really research that but I, I remember as long as there have been kings in Europe and kings and queens in Europe and and how they were all interrelated in, through various countries and, and that's all obvious it was a very long time okay and then how royalty kind of met its natural demise as people became more educated, more aware, and more interested in having more rights, more of what that 1% had. And, you know, the royalty just lost the chance to beat everybody down because too many, in too many cases, the army kind of went with the people and that was it for royalty. But then we enter another era where you have business royalty who maybe some of the same people who were in the royal family and originally who moved over into business or you know in the case of russia people that who knows maybe they were part of you know the original rulers of russia back before the soviet union that the um, original soviet purges didn't kill off who uh who just fell back into that it was just people who were um and that's just the 1% has been the 1% for a very, very, very long time. And now we're at a place again where the people sort of realize that and want to have some sort of, of meaningful dialogue at least about where we can go, how most, how the majority can see more of the fruits of their labor and how the 1% might turn into the 10% or the 40% or even the 60% of people that are all contributing things of value. Of course, then there's the whole other wrench getting thrown into the works of automation coming to the workplace and, you know, human labor not being as important as it used to be and the various fixes that are being ad uh, um, advanced there as, as potential realities like universal basic income aware um you know and, and i thought of an interesting scenario that could be a, a science fiction story actually where you sit at home and, and you have a sort of robot spouse who you know goes out and is the breadwinner for the family and comes home and and you know does all the work and and you get the paycheck and you spend it however you see fit and you know you're responsible for maintenance of your robot and you know, that would be another way to do universal basic income and automation. So, uh, but anyway, just, just in closing, I would like to, you know, a few sentient points to make would be just that there seems to be a lot more to the Trump slash Russia slash Putin story than we are even being made aware of in the U.S. And that's a shame because, I mean, the news cycle is so fast now and you know the perceived attention span of people like you and i is so small that um the media tries to just rush everything and give it in little bite-sized easy to understand pieces and as a result i think we're missing out on the bigger picture and that's what we need to understand and that's why i made this particular podcast so if you've watched it to this point i appreciate it thank you and um, please, I'd like it to be a discussion. We can, um, you know, in the comments on YouTube or on the podcast, it would be great to hear what you think and maybe have some meaningful discussion. I especially am interested, and I may do another podcast on this, just the idea of how um, people who are politically interested and socially interested in all countries could have sort of an online dialogue that maybe would shape or at least help to shape 
the future of the human race on the planet. So thanks a lot for watching. Um, check out the resources below. And yes, the, the links are affiliate links. So if you go to Amazon and buy a book by one of the publishers that I, or by one of the authors that I talked about in the video, I will get a little bit of money. So I would appreciate it if you do that because it would really help me to make more of these videos. And I would like to make more of them on a whole wide range of topics because I have a wide range of interests. Thanks a lot. I'll see you next time. Bye.